Welcome back folks to another devlog video of my crazy and slightly weird game called Life Code. In this episode we'll talk all about how creatures behave in that sweet ass simulated world we created last episode. It has taken some time and thought to get this to somewhat how I like it. But before we dive too deep into that, let's give those new to the channel a quick recap. I post my job five months ago to try and make a game even though I don't know how. I decided to do it in the Rust programming language and using the Bevy game engine. The, game, the actual game is about creating species in a sandbox-like world while you try to maintain a balanced and working ecosystem. The species are supposed to be programmed by you using some of the popular and available programming languages such like JavaScript or Python. Everything will also run in the browser, making it super accessible for everybody. Fantastic. With everybody on the same page, the next obvious step in development was to actually let the creatures perform actions. These actions include having them attack, eat, and even mate with each other, letting them sleep, run around, see and remember stuff. All this had to be implemented from scratch, while at the same time, I had to keep in mind how I would let the player's custom code control all this at a reasonable level. Sounds cool? Then you need to follow this channel right now! Alright, my plan is that players will be creating species in a sims-like UI. After having configured some of the base stuff, like what the species is allowed to eat, its size, speed and so on, the player will have to write the code which controls the creature's actions. The code the player writes, which I call life code, same as the title of the game, will have as input everything a creature sees or feels and as output an action. Let's take a quick peek on the actual creature API. This API will be used by the players when they create their life code. Looking into the code, we can see that the creature input API, which is the input for uh, everyone's functions, uh, consists of the health, how much food in their belly, the stamina, age, size, and if the, uh, the creature is pregnant or not, its gender, how it's moving, and also its memory. All these will probably change in the coming future, but this is the current state. And scrolling down a bit, we can see that we have creatures here, and these are the visible creatures that the creature sees. And they have their own struct, which includes um, mo many of the same fields here, but uh, not, for example, memory. A creature wouldn't be able to see another creature's memory. That would be weird. And here we have conditions. These are the humidity, temperature, and so on at the current creature location and very similar we have the foods these are the foods at the current location so this was the input let's take a look at the output each creature's life code the code that the players write will have to output one of these actions these include sleep eat attack mate just move sniff and speak sniff and speak i haven't implemented yet but you can tell by the names, this is smelling for stuff and this is making sounds. A normal game runs at around 60 FPS, but it would be both bad for performance and gameplay to let the player's life code run that often. Imagine a creature changing its action 60 times a second. This would open up for a very indecisive and jumpy behavior. What I've done instead is to have the creature's life code run in an interval of 1-2 seconds. This means running people's code 100 times less often, which will be crucial for performance as I want to have hundreds or even thousands of creatures being simulated at the same time. And if life was easy, I would of course have everything run at the same time, synchronized, meaning that every second in the game all creatures life code would execute. This however won't be feasible and will either cause large frame spikes or latency issues. At 60 FPS, you have about 16 milliseconds to do all the calculations and render it to the screen. Having to run hundreds or thousands of life codes with potentially slow execution would not turn out great. To solve this, I let every creature has its time in the sun. Each creature, or rather life code, will have a slot at which it will execute. This spreads the compute to all frames evenly 
as to not get frame spikes. It wasn't always easy to implement all the mechanics needed. I, for example, had some problems getting the movement correct. All creatures are actually simulated using a physics engine, and each creature has its weight, size, and power. By simulating physics, creatures can bump into one another, but it also means that I'm no longer allowed to set the positions manually, and instead have to apply a force and a torque to guide the creatures. I used a PID controller for this, which sets an appropriate force to the creature. And luckily, I have my fair share of experience when it comes to control theory, as I am a proud father to many robots. So I know that setting the gains for the PID controller correctly is the difference between ice skating raccoons and responsive yet natural movements. To make sure I wouldn't break things every time I change the code, I set up my very own testing facility. In here we can isolate every action and test it in a controlled setting. So here we have a square where they're just making tons of super cute raccoon babies. And in this square we can see a really sad raccoon just dying and dying all over again. All in the name of science. But I can assure you no animals were harmed in the making of this video. Even though they stand here attacking each other. Oh. Oh, they both died. That's an even fight. And we can go look over here. Here we have, if I reset it, here we have a race with stops to see which age is best to run at. Apparently this little sucker is really fast and does not stop. I'll have to look into that. Before I had all this set up, I basically just observed the creatures in the world and waited for the right conditions, which was, to say the least, a bit tedious. I also have this debug mode, for example if I select this creature, I can go into the debug mode, I can see this blue section here is what it can see, and these blue lines indicate that it has seen a creature there. The lines can also show if an action has a target, for example here this creature is trying to mate with this creature, and we can see that with this line here. Whenever you create a framework of some sort, like I've done here with the creature API, it's really good to eat your own dog shit. What? I meant to say dog food. In short, dog fooding means that you use the product you yourself have developed. Okie dokie, so let's actually try this. I coded the behavior for rabbits and foxes using the API we talked about before. The players will do this in the browser, but I haven't implemented that yet, so I'll just compile this into the program itself. With the code all typed up, I realized I need the API to be simpler to use the player should be able to choose the abstract level and write their code thereafter. This makes it easy for beginners to quickly create something that sort of works and for experts to customize to their heart's content. But I'll fix that later, let's get this show on the road. Alright, here we go. Two foxes hunting down a poor rabbit, eating its corpse. They won't go hungry tonight, I don't think so. And over here we see two raccoons just minding their own business, trying to find, I think, mushrooms. And here we have a big population of rabbits. Keep an extra eye on the graph in the middle. The turquoise line is the population of the rabbits and the greenish line is the population of the foxes. Uh, we'll increase the speed here to 30 times the normal speed to just to see what happens to the population. The rabbits population have now tripled and it's increasing. The foxes population has a slow start, but it will start to increase now. The rabbit's population now, now declines steeply, heading down to almost zero soon. The fox's population just keeps growing and there the rabbits all died out and soon after will the foxes all die out too. I talk a bit about these population patterns in my first devlog video. If you haven't seen it, check it out. I call them creatures and not animals because when everybody makes their own, they will become sort of fictional. And even though I right now only have models of actual real animals, I haven't yet decided if I should have only made up creatures or only real animals in the game. The good thing about fictional creatures is that when people create their own, they will look similar to what others have created and what will be in the game. Everything would have the same style. On the other hand, having real-like animals, like I have right now, 
will make it easier for the players to initially understand the behavior of the in-game animals. For example, everybody knows that a fox hunts and kills other animals. But what would the new species that players create look like? There would be a risk of clashing if they look too different. Help me untwine this conundrum by discussing it in the comment section below. Great and awesome. This video is long enough and I will leave you with a few good old fashioned bugs. Well hello my dear. Oh my god! Stop walking like that! Dear I can see right through you. Don't look at me like that. Oh crap what did I do wrong this time? No! That's it dear. I give up on you. Go home. You're drunk. See you next episode where I talk about how I make an awesome UI with the help of AI.